Hey, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic graph theory. Today, I'm not going to do algebraic graph theory, or I kind of do. So I'm going to tell you about mat matroids, 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 whatever you want to call them. Um, and that most people probably wouldn't count them as being part of algebraic graph theory, but I kind of feel like they're in the same flavor of what I've seen we've seen before, as we will kind of ex as I kind of will like try to explain in this video. They're a mixture between linear algebra and graphs. And what was algebraic graph theory? It was a mixture between linear algebra and graphs. So I think it's actually quite quite uh, it fits quite well. But keep in mind that a lot of people probably wouldn't count it as part of well, algebraic graph theory. Anyway, I do, or at least in this series, I do. Uh, if you ask me tomorrow, I might have a different opinion, but let's ignore that. Anyway, so let's get into the math. So it's kind of a fun story. Um, the, the notion of a matroid came, came around in the 1930s. So it's pretty old by now, and it has grown in its own field. Um, or a subfield of algebraic graph theory, depending on who you ask. Anyway, uh, so it's kind of large and it's really beautiful because it kind of generalizes two things or three things at once, bases, forests, and partitions. And that's kind of exciting because, okay, for, one of them is linear algebra, one of them is graphs, and the other one is combinatorics. And you get everything in one packet, which is fantastic. So let's have a look. And I just motivated by examples. And then I show you the definition, which is surprisingly simple. It's just really, really easy. Um, but anyway, we look at examples. So we take a matrix. Here's our matrix A. And it has some column vectors. We have uh, eight of them. And we could ask the question is, what are the subset of the column vectors that form a basis? So here, for example, um, if if uh, this illustration that I stole hasn't messed up, well, if I haven't messed up, is because I, I didn't double check. Um, these are some examples of bases. We just choose, for example, uh, the vector two here, um, the vector four, apparently, the vector six, and the vector eight, and they will form a basis. And here's another one, and here's another one. Okay. And what we are like to answer is well, bases are great. Vector spaces, bases, we always work with them. Fantastic. The, the, the bases of linear algebra are bases, I guess. Um, but what are the fundamental properties? So what we usually do in math is we kind of have a concept that we, which is thumbs up, we like a lot. And then we want to kind of stripe it, stripe away all the difficulty and kind of want to just have the fundamental properties of the concept, because eventually that will help us to generalize what's going on. You might have seen that, for example, with metric spaces, which generalizes distance. And it really just is a really brilliant idea of just getting rid of all the fuss around distance and just focus on what is really important. And we are trying to do the same. So what is really important or what, what makes bases of vector spaces special? What makes bases of vector spaces special? Well, let's say um, they exist. That's already a kind of a problem, uh, kind of a great uh, property. By the way, I will already talk about finite dimensional things. Fine, okay. But anyway, they exist. So that's uh, absolutely fantastic. And more excitingly, we have this cool property, and that's kind of turns out to be the defining property of a basis that we kind of can exchange vectors, the, the vector exchange property between bases and still get um, bases, which is kind of a really fun thing to do. So here, for example, here we have this vector is here, uh, maybe with a different color. This vector is here. Um, this vector is here. And we kind of exchange some of the vectors. So we can always do that with bases. You can even kind of exchange vectors in a some controlled sense without losing the property that you have a basis. Um, and that turns out to be the fundamental property that we want to generalize. And it's kind of brilliant because that's not the first thing that would have come to my mind at least. But that's what it turns out to be. And then um, we observe <laughs> that the same property is true for, for example, spanning forests. So forest is just a collection of trees and spanning means it hits all vertices. So here are, so the graph that I have here in the background is kind of the graph in the background is this one here. And the collection you see here, these are all spanning trees, forests, whatever. 
of the graph. And again, we ask the same question, what makes them special? And again, they exist. We hooray, they exist, yay. So you can always find them, but you can also exchange edges between them. So vectors have now changed to edges, but you still have kind of the same type of property. You can exchange edges between them in some controlled way, and you still get a basis. So if you kind of get rid of this edge, and at this edge, for example, you would get the, the one next to it, right? So uh, this was really bad. So let me try again. If you would uh, get rid of this edge, and at this edge, then you would get the one next to it. Uh, if you would have done the other one, then I would need to look where the other one actually is, and it's here. Then I would have gotten this one. Anyway, so you can always somehow exchange edges between them um, as soon as you don't create a cycle. So here, what you don't want to create is a linear dependence. And here, what you don't want to create is a cycle, because then you don't have a tree anymore or a forest. But it's kind of a really the same property. And that's kind of exciting. In particular, observe. Um, that they all have the same size. So here, all bases are of size four. Here, all spanning trees have three edges. And that kind of follows from this basic, uh, from this base vector exchange property, which is one of the fundamental properties of forests as well, not just of bases. Turns out that it's also the fu fundamental property of partitions. Okay, let me just don't be, got to get too much into details, but let me just do the following. I have put three numbers on the bottom. And I put um, three numbers on the top, and I have two partitions. So I will always put two numbers together in in a set. And the way I do is I just collect connect whatever whatever I feel um, should be connected. And so this set would have one and two in one, three and two prime, one prime and three prime. And on the right hand side, you see all possibilities to um, have two partitions of this set. So two part two here really just means you always put two in a set. And this just means I connect two dots with one another and I have no restrictions on how I connect dots. And what makes them so special? <laughs> they exist. I just have written them down, um, but you can always exchange uh, whatever uh, elements in the partition, which just corresponds to a move something like going from here to here. For example, you just exchanged uh, which, which partition belongs to which one. So here you have this connection. Um, and here, you, well, this was a really bad. Let me try with a different color. So here I have this connection. Um, uh, sorry, on the right hand side, you have exactly this connection. And as you can see, compared to the left hand side, there was some exchange happening here, right? So you just exchange something in the same property. Um, so exactly the same. And it turns out it's one of the fundamental properties of partitions. So all of these have these two properties. And then the brilliance is to observe that and put it together in a definition. So let's see, a matroid is a pair of our kind of base set E, a finite set, everything is finite. Okay. And a subset of bases such that they exist. Well, great. So <laughs> we don't choose an empty subset. And then there's this basic exchange property. So whenever you have two subsets, so two bases in, in your set, and you will find an element, um, you, you can, Pick an element in A, not in B. Then you can exchange it with with some element in B, such that you get a basis again. Uh, that's it. That's the definition of a matroid. Really simple. Uh, in some sense, okay, existence fine, fine. Otherwise, the story is a bit boring anyway. And the, the other one is crucial: the basis exchange property, which was a string change property, an edge change property, and a vector change property on my three examples. And obviously, well, otherwise, well, maybe not obviously, but otherwise my uh, kind of story would be very flawed here. Uh, the examples we had before are uh, matroids. Uh, but they are slightly more obscure examples. So what, for, uh, what you, for example, what you can do, is a really slightly obscure matroid. And that's a whole part of this definition. It generalizes something. So there should be also some more fun examples somewhere. And here's one. So we can take the eight points that you see here and bases are all, all collections of four points. Okay, that's a bit boring. So I say they are all collections of four points, which are not uh, giving those sets that you see here, those spanning planes. So you can choose this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex for your bases because there is no face, but you could not choose, for example, this vertex, 
this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. And if you go through the definition, you will see that this is actually a matroid. Not quite clear, uh, but it is. And it's not of the form we have seen before. It's kind of a new example. And that's what we want, right? We have a generalized definition. So we want new examples to behave like what we have seen before. So here you go. Here's an example. It's a really nice definition in some sense. And it really vastly generalizes uh, basis forest and partitions. So here's another example, which uh, matroids are everywhere, which is also slightly obscure. Strictly speaking, this one is actually a, one of the basis type, but, but it's not, not obvious at all. So we do the following. It's called the Fainal Matroid, and it has seven points. It's exactly um, the points that you see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the basis being the lines. And you can always kind of exchange points in the basis such that you get a new basis. So it will satisfy the basis exchange property. Anyway, so uh, why I like matroids so much is because I like forests, I, I like graphs, I like linear algebra, and I like combinatorics. There you go. And then they generalize everything at once in some sense. So you get everything, you ray. Of course, you don't get everything, but it's a kind of a large definition. And it turns out, that's kind of the whole point, that most of the story, you know very well, let's say, for example, from bases and linear algebra, will go through in this generalized definition, which is really the crucial point. That's absolutely amazing. And that's what makes matroids so fantastic. And I'm going to cover a little bit about them in the upcoming videos. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.